Are you living the life you want? Spending enough time with the ones you love? Welcome to the Real Estate of Mind show where you'll learn how becoming a successful real estate investor can change your life like it did ours. We're here to help you reach all of your goals and create wealth through real estate investing. So let's roll. All right, welcome back to the Real Estate of Mind show with your host, Glenn and Amber Schwarm. Hello, everybody. Where we help everyday people create wealth through real estate investing. You know, we try and find good guests all the time to come out here and help and educate and uh, bring um, you know, what we think you need. And so uh, everyone's always looking for money, right? That's always- Yeah, resources. Yeah, everybody wants to know where the money is, right? Everybody wants, where, give me money. I think that's the hardest part of it, this thing. It's, you know, ironically, it's it's a part of it, but not the hardest part. So we have got Christian Batchelder here today. And uh, Christian, welcome, man. Glad to have you. Hey guys, appreciate being here. Yeah, it's from One Lending. No, is it One Lending? Is it- One Brokerage. One Brokerage, sorry, One Brokerage. <laughs> one Brokerage, so cool. Well, listen, man, give us a little background on you. I'd like to know a little about you and what you do and tell our listeners uh, about you. Yeah, absolutely. I had a, I have kind of a weird track that led me here. Um, I started out in chemical engineering of all things. Oh, wow. okay. uh, yeah, completely, completely 180. Um, kind of went into that whole tech field and um, I, I graduated from UC Berkeley um, and just did not find, I, I was in the really weird kind of subset where my skills did not really line up with what I enjoyed. So like I, I was good in engineering, right? Like I had a gift for it. I was good in my academics, good in the, the, the internships and the jobs that I landed after that, but it just absolutely no resonance with my enjoyment, right? Nothing that, that really made me feel good being there. So, um, took a, took a random shot in the dark. I got a little, you know, into real estate. I joined, um, you know, just kind of a, a family brokerage in my area, um, from a family friend of mine. Um, and just man fell in love, saw the power that real estate can help people achieve. And, you know, then yeah, I got into financial independence and, you know, financial literacy and just understanding investments, um, and found myself eventually progressing from being a real estate agent to being a broker and into being a loan officer and originating my own loans. Um, and then I even added insurance services. So becoming an insurance broker as well, kind of in the mentality of, hey, I wanted, when I first started, my goal was for every client that I met, I wanted to turn that into three clients, right? So for anybody in a sales position, you know, a lot of your your listeners may even be realtors themselves. I know a lot of, you know, fix and flippers and investors get their license to, to support themselves as well. And, um, you know, imagine if every client that you could prospect was three, right? You had a loan client, an insurance client, and a real estate client, and potentially even an investing partner, because obviously, like most people, um, this eventually, you know, progressed into me actually investing myself, right? And I'm a long term hold. Uh, I do Airbnbs, but that's kind of the overview of, of everything I got going on right now. Wow. It's interesting that you're, we, we were at a, um, a Anthony Robbins business mastery several years ago. And one of the things that he said is find out what your ideal, ideal client needs before, during, and after the sale. Yeah. Those businesses. So you're you're kind of taking that approach to to the one brokerage. But I think it's also interesting that you figured out just because you're good at something doesn't mean you necessarily like it. Our nine-year-old daughter last week, I, she was saying, you know, I I I don't I'm not having fun with this mom. And I'm like, really? But you're so good at it. And she said those exact words, just because I'm good at something doesn't mean I like it. And I, I was like, wow, that's pretty insightful for a nine-year-old to figure that yeah, out. Yeah, that is. I was about this, this took me. Yeah, 20, 25 years to come to that understanding. Um, so she's, man, you got a little uh, go-getter on your hands there. But yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that was definitely something where, you but know. It's so key for our listeners too, because I think so many people are in that position. You know, oh, they're yeah. in a job that they they're they have the skills to do, but they're not getting enjoyment out of life. And so I think that's a really key point to kind of hone in on. hundred percent. Yeah, and that that's the moment I kind of realized that, obviously I made that pivot and, you know, not only financial wise, but just like quality of life enjoyment wise. Um, it was definitely the right decision for me, not saying it would be for everybody, but you know, it, it's, it's a, uh, it's something to, you know, that you don't always put two and two together that, you know, a lot of people just go into something. I'm good at it. I, I got to go do that. That's where my skill set is, you know? Yeah. Christian, were you part of bigger pockets at all? Or are you now, you mentioned, you mentioned David Green before. I'm but... integrated a lot. Um, yeah, I guess, let me clarify that. Um, I, I co-started the one brokerage with David Green of the bigger pockets podcast, just for clarity for the listeners. Um, and, uh, so I business partner with David, I'm a guest on the podcast regularly, but I'm not like a bigger pockets employee or featured by wow. them or anything like that. Um, yeah. we are a featured lender. So, I mean, we're, you know, a lot of our lending services get, get broadcast on bigger pockets. Uh, but I, I partner with the individual David Green, not the conglomerate bigger pockets, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I asked that question because we were 
Amber and I, you know, David's kind of the second generation coming through of bigger pockets people. Yeah. Friends with, with Brandon Turner and uh, Josh a little bit in the early days because we, we, we were the we were the fifteenth podcast for bigger pockets. Amber, and that's I awesome. But yeah, you look back. One, one of my neighbors down the road said, "Wait a minute, wait a minute." We moved here. We moved to Florida. He's like, "Wait, did you guys on bigger pockets?" I said, "I were." So he went back and raced it. Oh my god, I remember when that came out. It was a long time ago. But oh, how funny! That's long, awesome. Long, so I, you mentioned bigger pockets. Brought back some good memories of. Uh, working with those guys. I used to be a blogger on there. I used to write a lot of blogs too. Back nice. Then. And then they, I know Josh sold it and it, now it's run by more of a company. I think I was a hedge Correct. Fund. Yeah. Yeah. Hedge fund type, type structure. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I know they they've expanded. I think they got, you know, nine or 10 podcasts now all in different branches. I know they have like, you know, the rookie podcast and, and, you know, they have like the market, the market watch podcast. So um they they got a lot of cool things going on over there. Obviously yeah. David's still, you know, the primary, the primary podcast, but Sure. Um, That's a lot of podcasts to do, man. That's a lot of podcasting for sure. Sure is. Sure is. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's fun. Everybody, uh, everybody about money. So you you know, tell them what you do with money. And I'm also curious to know your take on where we are in the economy, right? That's that's a hot yeah. Topic. Great question. Where are we in the economy? What's that look like? You know, what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, just what what are the experts in your world saying on yeah. the internet about the economy, the interest rates, and where it's going, how it's going to affect all of us as investors? Yeah, hundred percent. Um, so let me, I, let me answer both parts of that. Um, first and foremost, what I do is I, I'm, I'm the money guy, right? So I get people the financing that they need, whether it's for a long-term hold, a fix and flip project, yada, yada. And just to kind of consolidate everything into three main points, um, lending can be really be broken up into three categories. Your first is conventional. That's the, the Fannie Freddie stuff, the stuff, the government runs the, the FHA, the VA, a lot of orchestrated around primary residences, debt to income ratios. You got to qualify, you know, you, you run out of qualifying potential in that realm pretty quickly. Um, I don't qualify there myself anymore. I have over 10 properties currently. So once you get over 10, you just can't get another conventional loan, right? That may be something that a lot of listeners are familiar with. Um, there's also debt to income ratios and FICO requirements and all the stuff, right? The second category is non-QM lending, which is non-conventional. Um, that's a blanket term that really means anything but conventional, but it really hones in on um, anything for a long-term hold or a medium-term hold is what I would say, right? So not your bridge products, not your fix and flip loans, right? And the third category is just the hard money. I need a loan for six to 12 months to purchase and renovate a property, right? Um, right. And that's obviously as you go up that list, interest rates get more cost to acquire gets more, but access to capital gets easier, sure. right? So just from an underwriting perspective. Um, so that's what we do. We, we have all three of those brackets at our company. So I, I'm responsible of going and formulating these lending partnerships. A common misconception is I'm not lending my own dollars, right? I don't have 500 million a month fund, <laughs> right? Um, right? Yeah, we know. But, but we're, we're procuring you know, lending partnerships um, and, you know, helping them build products. We give a lot of feedback. We're a pretty high volume brokerage. So we give a lot of feedback into what customers are looking for. Um, and we have some power to actually help influence what, what products are available, which is pretty fun, right? We're able to kind of be on that capital market side. Um, and then to answer your second question, what is my opinion of where we are? Well, I mean, we're in, we're in this time where we just printed some, oodles number of money right i mean just about, yeah stuff we don't even know about yeah yeah i mean it's just and you know it's it's it, obviously everything right now is perspective just because it, we've, we've never really done this right but what i would say is if if i told you that a dollar bill was just getting less and less and less valuable i would say it's got to get into something more real it's got to get into obviously i'm biased i'm a real estate guy but that could be anything i mean if somebody's a, a real true big crypto believer. I'm not, but okay, that's something that's not the dollar, right? And obviously savings and reserves are important. Every good investor knows you, you got to have your foundation. You got to have your base, right? Sure. But me personally, I, I am in such a, it's a strategic, you know, employment, but trying to get as much into a real asset that I know, for instance, I invest in, in short-term rentals. I invest in markets. You guys mentioned you're in Florida. I invest in markets that I don't really see anybody not wanting to be at in the future. Like I invest in the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. It's not just all of a sudden going to be the most visited national park in America is all of a sudden not going to want to be visited, right? Like that's something that I can I can put my flag in and say, hey, I have confidence here. I feel like this is going to be, you know, really good projections in the future. People are going to want to be here, you know, whereas 
I don't know if, if you're going to want to be in your bank account in 10 years. <laughs> right? I mean, I don't know what with our inflation. I mean, you know, the number says it's seven to eight percent. It's not. You know, I mean, things are if you guys run your, you know, you just your cost analysis, your monthly expenses have gone up by more than seven percent. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So just my my taking all of my industry knowledge away, just complete common sense wise. If there's more and more and more and more of one thing and our only reaction to hard times is make more of it. I got to take that and get the most value for it in another realm. Yeah. Right? I just, that's, it's the only thing that I can realistically make myself feel good about in investing. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add one more thing to this. And this is maybe something where a lot of your, your listeners could, uh, could benefit from hearing this myself personally, that David and I talk about this a lot. Quantitative easing, which is just a fancy word of, of the process of how the government printed money. They they printed all of this money, put it in a circulation, and now there's a the alternative that's called quantitative tightening, which is where they're kind of trying to take money out of the system, right? The problem is once it's created, you you can't just destroy it because that money has usually been spent, it's been leveraged, it's back into the economy. It's not like you can go back to people and unprint money. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So David and I go back and forth. There's a lot. They, the government raises interest rates to try to limit growth and limit access to capital, and that's how they kind of take out money. In my opinion, I think it's fairly obvious how the government can take money out of the economy, and I think it's with taxes. Yeah. It's the only, the only transactional process in America where the gov a money goes from us to the government. It's the only one. So just doubling down, this is what I'll end on. Why not take advantage of the asset class that gives you the most tax advantage position? Right. 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 And I mean, if, if you guys really go study the American tax code, it is very preferential to one investment type, right? Oh, yeah. Not stocks, not annuities, not anything right. else. It's, it's, it's go buy real estate. You can upfront depreciate. You can essentially get tax-free income. You get breaks for renovating properties. I mean, it's like, yeah, you know. It's a lot. Yeah. Not to mention that just the track record of, of how much it appreciates. I mean, real estate hundred percent appreciates twenty. Uh, it doubles every twenty years. Yeah. What and then you, there's yeah. and then there's a ten thirty one. So you don't you can even defer taxes once you get sure. to the end point. You know, it's just it's pretty crazy. Yeah. What what do what do you and all the industry experts that you associate with on a daily basis? What what are you seeing in the volume of overall loans now? Has it slowed significantly since? They That's a great the question. Industry wise, it's slowed drastically, right? Yeah. Yeah. However, this is kind of a unique insight. So I, I appreciate this question because it allows me to share things that are usually behind the scenes. What I can tell you is our our, our, our gross volume, I guess I'll call it, of pre-approvals is higher than it's ever been. So, and what I mean when I say that is this isn't meant to be a scare tactic, but there is more money waiting on the sideline. Sure. Than, I've, than I've ever seen. Right. I'm sure. And we're one brokerage and I have hundreds of millions of dollars in purchasing power pre-approved from people who have come to us and gotten a pre-approved. Like it's people with money, they're qualified. You know, it's people with jobs, it's people with assets. So like, these are people who fundamentally can buy a property. They're just like, well, I'm going to see what happens. And so obviously people are still buying, you know, there's good opportunities in every market. But man, when people say I'm expecting a 50, 60% decrease in real estate prices, I'm like, these guys are going to go catch it far before it gets there because these people are going to see 10 and 20% discounts. And like, that's going to be a hard floor. Like there's too much money sitting here waiting, you know? So yeah, I don't see it being a big crash. And you know, Amber and I were around 2007, 2008. That's when we started our flipping business. We had rentals before that. We started our flipping then. I don't see it being a big crash. I mean, some areas are going to take a hit for sure. Oh, yeah. right? Overall, Spread across the board. I don't think we're going to see a massive decline. And we're going to see some, but I don't think it's going to be. I don't, it won't be like 2007, 2008. I don't. Yeah. I don't. You know. Again, I've learned through COVID that you just don't know what the hell the government's going to do. I mean, they could do it. Yeah. They, in New York, they they made it so people people didn't have to pay rent, and we yeah. had to go two years now having to pay rent, and I had to pay all my bills, taxes, insurance, mortgage. They they wanted their taxes on time. Well, you can sure ship promise that. That's what they wanted. But so when that happened, I thought they have a lot more power than we. Thing. Yeah, they can do whatever they, they made. They, they made us walk around wearing masks for two years. Like a bunch yeah. of I mean, it's you know, it's ridiculous. But like back then, that was a real estate crisis, and this is yeah. very different. And 
and and most of the people that have mortgages have really good rates on their mortgages. Now. Yeah. So very, very different. Situation. And equity. Right. And, equity. and right. massive amounts of equity. That's a big difference from 2008. People were buying with 0% down, no doc loans. Right. Now, yeah. like everybody who got a, you know, a, a non qm loan or a bridge loan, they're putting 20% down. Right. And the, and the market, I mean, a lot of markets were up 30% appreciation last year, you know, yeah. 30, 40% in certain markets. Like if we have a 40% drop, a lot of people are set back to what they bought last year. Right. And they're, and they still put 20% down. So they still got that. You know, it's like the, the, wave of foreclosures i mean that it is a very different situation than it, it is. I, I very see, I different i don't see that being a big wave of foreclosure i i, I you know, when it first happened i thought now we're, if it, you know as we go into a recession we're going to see tougher times people get laid off that kind of stuff so 100 we'll percent, we'll see liquidation of, of properties for sure but are you you know how do you lend so there are there are if you have different packages, there I've heard about lenders that lend off. Now, this is I'm speaking a little out of uh, out of my level of expertise. That's okay. Go for it. There's people lend based on the treasury, and there's people lend based on something else. I forgot mm -hmm. what it was. Now, well, there's two different ways to kind of kind of lend, right? Yeah, and it's really determined. That is a good question. This is getting in the weeds a little bit. I like it a little bit. Uh, well, I think it's, 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 people like to know that because it, it is good. It, you, there could be better rates. So it's treasury and what there's um. So there's a lot. So the 10 year treasury has a has a pretty close uh, correlation to mortgage interest rates. But Correct. that's typically like the Fannie Freddie stuff, right? That's the okay. conventional loans, right? That's basically where the government creates a rule set, so to speak, right? They, they create your 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 code. I'm an engineer, I'm going to nerd out for a second, right? Sure. <laughs> um, and then a bunch of lenders across the nation get set up to lend according to those guidelines. Those are called like Fannie Mae guidelines, right? They can offer, there's like the Fannie Mae base rate, which is correlated with the treasury yield and what inflation's doing and all that. But there, there's a whole lot that goes on behind the scene in capital markets where they actually buy like futures protection insurance policies to protect their rates and pay them a spread. There's, there's a bunch, but all in all, they, they, they lend based on that. And then whatever lender is implementing it can charge like origination fees and maybe a, a part of a percent over what they're guaranteed to get from Fannie Mae. Yep. Okay. Now there's the crazy world of non-QM and, and private money and, and hard money. That's kind of like, I don't have to go based on anything, right? That's, that's this bank's money, this, this institution, they set aside, you know, a billion dollars in equity, whatever it's going to be, right? In capital, I mean, um, and they're creating their own rule set, right? They said, we don't need Fannie Mae. We don't need them. We're not going to sell to them. So we don't care. And we want to fund fix and flips. Right. We, we, we believe in in the American go getter mentality of going and finding a, a property that's beat up and putting some sweat equity to it and, and forcing appreciation. Right. And they don't have to go buy anything. They're going by what they feel like their returns need to be right to run a profitable business. So it's the further and further way you get out from like the standardized procedure of conventional lending, the more kind of like I call it the Wild West of lending. You It's kind of like a. You know, the market gets set because there's a lot of fix and flip lenders. So like it usually settles around the same spot. But like some people may run a special and like be 2% below the the industry average. Right. And obviously that's the people that everybody's, you know, hustling to go find. Right. Sure. Um, oh, yeah. But in my experience, the people who are the lowest rates, usually not good. They usually don't fund the loan. They usually can't do it in time. You know, they usually have all these hoops that you got to jump through because they want to fund the absolute cream of the crop because they know everybody's coming to them. Right. Which is, you know, at the end, of kind of the, the final point here is this is where it's really beneficial. And this is not a sales pitch for me, but go talk to a broker if somebody's looking to get a loan. That's as simple as I can make it. If you got a local community bank and you're in tune with them and they've gotten a lot of flexibility with you now, cool, awesome. You're probably going to get lower rates with them. But if you're pivoting between different loan products and different states and different areas, I invest in multiple states myself. Mm -hmm. You can't find a bank that's going to follow you in every asset class that you dive into, right? A broker can, right? I mean, we have, we were talking before we turned on the recording here, we have over 300 products, right? Where we can flip and pivot and change and, 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 and audible the whole way through your investing journey, right? Which is fun, right? And I like playing that like Lego game. Um, and once again, guys, that's not coming to me. That's just, that's just a broker. Obviously, I am one, but the process is so much smoother when you don't have to worry about, 
pulling a new credit report with a new lender, every state and every product and every asset class that you get into. Well, right? That's a good point. So I guess, so I guess, you know, sometimes you think that a broker might be more expensive because it's a middleman. So you're paying extra points. Great and- question. I love this. That's Perfect question. Mind, so yeah, it's actually the alternative and I'll explain why. So you guys, you guys have like Costco's around you, you know, Costco, like big Costco warehouse, right? So the equivalent is, and Matt Ishbia, the president of UWM actually had a, was on the podcast, uh, the Bigger Pockets podcast with David. He got asked the same question, right? Brokers are typically considered to be more expensive. Well, imagine if a lender gets me as a client and I have a really good marketing campaign or strategy, they don't have to pay for commercials on the Super Bowl. They don't have to pay for anything. So I get their rates, but lower. Yeah, I build in my spread in yeah. between the difference of those rates. And we don't build in our spreads to be back up to what retail rates are. So usually we cut a little bit on what they would make on their operating overhead. And I have one office and a few people and most people work remote. Like I don't have the overhead that like Quicken Loans has, <laughs> right? Like I don't have a Super Bowl commercial. I got to air for, I don't even know what Super Bowl commercials cost nowadays, 10 million, whatever it is, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so typically if you, and on average, I know um, Fannie Mae actually keeps this data. I think last year, um, mortgage brokered business as opposed to mortgage retail business was 0.387% cheaper on the rate and a quarter percent cheaper on the cost across oh. the entire country. That was like Fannie Mae actually released this and you guys, please, I implore everybody to go look it up um, yeah. because that is a super common misconception and it's one that brokers are trying to pivot. And I know in 2008, what you're saying was absolutely true because brokers would go charge seven points on a loan. Right. That's not that's not the reality anymore, right? We're we're governed by we actually have maximums that we can charge because of the fair, all the fair credit reporting acts and everything that came out in uh in two thousand eight. So that was an extended answer, but I wanted to make sure I was clear with that. No, it's a, honestly, it's a good answer. You know, we we all of our all of our holds are right now in besides where we live, they're all in upstate New York. Now we mm-hmm. want to start down here. We're sort of just watching for a second, we're like everybody else, just kind of hanging out and see what's going yeah. on here. For that particular one, we're still buying like crazy in New York. But, um, you know, I think having somebody like right now, I work with one bank for all the buy holds up there, right? Well, mm-hmm. I should say that we have three banks. I have really one primary that I do my lending with. We're sure. matched out with them, like, you know, we're probably about five million with them that we borrowed. And so they now everything has to go through the bank, the, the credit union president, you know, because we're, we're, yes. like, we're in the top two or top three clients. So it becomes a thing and it's more of a hassle now sometimes. And they can't help me down here. I have a great relationship with them. hundred percent. Whatever, all of our loans there, but now they don't have to. So I went to a local bank here in Florida when we first moved here. And it was like, it just felt different. I don't know anybody. I don't have any, they're like, oh, you can put money. You in street credit here. Right. I got to put money, money <laughs> yeah. in the closet. I'm like, actually all my banking is done in two, two banks in New York. So I, and I just keep it in my business. So Having a broker is a really good idea. I think, you know, after this, I'm going to get your number and reach out to you too. So sure. on that note, tell us how they can find you. Tell them how they can find you, how they can connect with you and, and all that. Yeah, stuff. absolutely. Uh, our website super straightforward, theonebrokerage.com, T-H-E-O-N-E. Um, we actually have the domain for the number one as well. Um, so spelled out or the number works, the one brokerage. Um, there's a there's a little contact us tab there. There's a little uh, inquiry form that you can fill out. Uh, my direct email is Christian at the one brokerage.com pretty straightforward um and i think on all social medias i got the underscore one underscore broker um that's on instagram tiktok whatever people are using right um i don't run it so if you're messaging me and get mad that i don't answer it's it's a team that runs it but um yeah that's that's where people can find me and um you know obviously would would be happy to help out anybody who's who's looking for some financing of everything from a classic long and hold to a fix and flip to everything in between Awesome. This is great, great information. And you you mentioned people um, have so many misconceptions about even even how much a broker charges. I think misconceptions are one of the biggest things that keep people out of real estate. So yeah, help clear those up and help people, you know, level the playing field with with what the possibilities are and and how much opportunity there is. This is awesome. Yeah, I understand. And I appreciate you guys asking those questions because that's, you know, like it's not sexy to talk about the difference between wholesale and retail rates and, yeah. you know, like, but, you know, everybody will say like, hey, I got the a way to, you know, buy a new uh, Airbnb with the no fail method. You know, everybody's going to go buy that course. <laughs> right? yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this, this has been great because at least I get a, I get a pull behind the curtains a little bit and say, hey, this is what actually happens behind the scenes, right? So yeah, no, I think, it's, I think it's great to do a broker. I think it's, I, I think it's a great thing. Like I said, I'm gonna reach out to you after here and uh, have a conversation. So 
Absolutely. Do me a favor and uh, reach out to Christian if you want to get some money. He's giving away free money today, he said. You need money. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, I heard that too. <laughs> we, we always say that to be successful in real estate, you, you don't have to have money, but you have to have access to money, right? If you Absolutely. have access to most money and wins, so you're a guy that can get them access to some capital. 100%. Yeah, reach out, guys. Hey, thanks for being on today, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, y'all. All right, everybody. That's another episode of the Real Estate of Mind Show. We'll see you on the next episode. Make sure you like and subscribe and leave us a review and leave us your questions and comments and we will personally answer and please share it to anyone you think could benefit. You can find us all over social media at Glenn and Amber Swarm. We'll see you next week.